I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl. Thanks for joining us. And Today we're going to introduce to you Brian Melanakis. Appreciate you coming. We met your Thanks. wife last time, Kathleen. What a wonderful story! And and you've been the fun thing is you've done it together, and I think that's awesome. That uh, we have, and only by the grace of God. Yeah. Such a momentous journey. Yeah. And so many have that uh, as a struggle to to do that together. But as we usually do, you tell us a little bit about your beginning. You're a multi-generational Mormon, and right? Yes. Uh, well, not, not too much multi-generational, oh, okay. just my, my mother. Uh, oh. I, I'm the uh, grandson of Greek immigrants on both sides. Okay. So my grandparents were all from Greece. My parents were born in this country, but uh, raised speaking Greek in the home. Wow. And, but we're not strong Greek Orthodox. And when I was still a baby, and we were living in Allen Park, Michigan, a couple of Mormon missionaries came to the, came to our doorstep, and they talked to my mother. And of course, I was still a baby, so I don't know everything that <laughs> happened. But my mother was converted, my father was not, oh. and that continued for the rest of their life. She was always an active Mormon, and she raised us four kids as Mormon. As Mormon, my father, a little bit grudgingly, let her do that, but he never he, jumped he in was himself. Supportive, huh? Now, was she Greek as well then? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yep. And, and so that's a big move for, a, for yeah. someone. Uh, for a Greek to give up the Orthodox religion is almost like giving up your Greekness. <laughs> so that alone was a big, not, big step. Not just your religion, but your whole uh, culture and identity. Your, a lot of your identity. Yeah. yeah. Oh, interesting. So active in the church then, your whole Active youth? in the church my whole youth. Yeah. Uh, right on through primary, I remember my one of my primary teachers saying, "You are going to be a great leader in the church someday." And I, things, a few things like that, really made an impression on me. Uh, when you're 12 years old in the sure. LDS faith, you become a, a deacon in the priesthood. That's right. And <clears throat> right on through Boy Scouts, the, the whole program, the MIA. I don't know if it's still called the MIA, but yeah, I, I always went, always went to MIA seminary. It, yeah. A lot of it, a lot of it, Earl, I think, was again the example of my mother. She sincerely seemed to sincerely believe it, her yeah. faith that she had converted to, and sincerely tried to live it. And, and taught you, and, and taught us, made sure and, you went yes. to church, and right, yeah, and, and really, any questions about the church at all? In her mind or yours? As you know, interestingly, I she never, I don't think she ever had any questions even after I left the church and kind of Just almost tried, to, tried to plant, <laughs> yeah, tried to share some of my questions with her. But I didn't, during the growing up times and the, even, even the teenage years, at least till the point where I went off to college, so at least till about the time of 18, I don't remember, and I don't think I did. I don't think I had any fundamental questions. It yeah. just seemed like this is the this, this is, is it. True. Yeah. I bore my was testimony a over and over. Joseph Smith is a prophet. Yeah. David O. McKay or Joseph Fielding Smith or Harold B. Lee is the is the only true prophet today, and so on. Yeah. So where did you go to school? 
I, I my first year I went to Michigan State okay. and then I came back that summer and that's a year that that's the only year where I really kind of drifted away not from Mormon belief but from Mormon living I did some things yeah. not not fully according to the Mormon uh, <laughs> rules and get so away on. from home a little straight, bit <laughs> straight away a little bit my yeah. my freshman year and I came back with every intention of finishing my uh, uh, degree at Michigan State but that summer after my freshman year I dated a couple of Mormon girls in my ward, and they really kind of influenced me to consider transferring to BYU mm. and how great the mountains were and how yeah. great it was to be around other LDS people. And so I did. So I went sophomore year at BYU. Okay. Then I went on a mission, came back, and finished up there. And where did you go on your mission? I went to Switzerland. Yeah. And uh, one of the reasons I was sent to Switzerland is because, uh, and this is way back in the 1970s, but they were hoping to open up Greece to um, missionaries, to okay. missionaries, and that was under the jurisdiction of the Switzerland mission. At that time. <clears throat> and so I and there must have been only five other Greeks at that time in the whole church, I thought, at the time. I'd, I'd never met a Greek Mormon before outside of my immediate family. Until your mission. But I huh? met five other Greek Mormons in the Switzerland mission. Yeah. And... Um, that was quite an experience. Uh, converted some people, definitely, in a relatively tough mission. Did they send you down to Greece at all? No, Did because you? it was never, the, the never government of Greece happened. never allowed it during that oh, time. Okay. Many years later, I had a nephew that had a mission in Greece, Mormon mission in Greece. Yeah. Oh. I know I've asked this question of other <clears throat> missionaries, and it's something that was important in my missionary experience. Did you feel like you were preaching the church, uh, the Bible, Jesus, the Book of Mormon, what, what were you teaching people? Well, I certainly believed in it most of the time I was there, but it's interesting, that from the very beginning, from my very first day working in Switzerland, I was instructed by the leadership of the mission not to say that we were from the Mormon church or the LDS church. The first mm -hmm. line when we knocked on the door is, we are two students from America and we're doing stu research oh. on the family. Really? And the reason they did this was because Switzerland was France, Switzerland's a relatively small country sure. and kind of tired of, they, they just were not very open to, to switching religions or to, certainly not to Mormons. What Mormon, was the Mormons main religion were a, there? Uh, they had a, they had a, it, yeah, it was basically, a, it was a Swiss national church, but it was a version of Lutheran. Okay. But even in that time in the 70s, and it's become much more secular since then. It was very secular. Most people did not go to church. Yeah. <clears throat> and so you, did you feel that was a, a deception of some sort? Well, a, about a month into it, I felt it was somewhat of a deception, especially when my senior companion at one point was asked by uh, a person answer, uh, answering the door. They said, are you from the Mormon church? And he said, no. Oh. We're students doing research, and I talked to him afterwards. I said, "How can you say we weren't from the Mormon Church?" And oh he said his answer was, "Well, we aren't from the Mormon Church. We work in the Mormon Church." I mean, it was just not a, <laughs> it was not a satisfying a bad answer. answer. A bad answer. <laughs> not a satisfying answer. But all the missionaries then were instructed all to the say that. All the missionaries did that. Yeah. I wonder if that. Yeah. Now we we weren't in Denmark, and I was in the '60s, but uh, that we weren't instructed that. They were also very Lutheran there in, in mm -hmm. Denmark, and very inactive, or seldom went to church, maybe right. on Easter and Christmas. So, right. But anyway, so what did you? What message did you give then? Well, we tried to get an appointment to have a family home evening, and note at no time in the first visit did it come up that we were from a church. We had a family home evening. We had a prayer. You called it a family a home evening? We, we called something? it family home evening, but this was just a program to help build families. And they thought you were students trying to... Testing out a secular program to help families. Or uh, let's say testing out a program. They had no reason to believe that it was from a church. Or from America? No, they knew it was from America. Okay, they didn't know We that. said we were from, and they okay. knew from our accent. Well, sure. Yeah. We spoke German, but not yeah, that good. not that good. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it, yeah. it, it wasn't like we're, we're okay. So, yeah. All right, they knew we were. So then we try to get a second appointment, and the way we'd try to get the second appointment, if they liked the fam a family home meeting, was we'd like to share with you some archaeological research about America, and we have a film we'd like to show you. And at that point, many American, many not Ameri many Americans, many of the Swiss people we met with, kind of liked us as we were, you know, kind oh, of sure. charming, trying yeah, to learn yeah. their language yeah. and their customs. And we, we might have dinner with them, 
So they'd invite us back, sure, we'll look at your we'll look at your movie. And the movie was on the Book of Mormon. So okay. then that's when we got into. Yeah. Only in that second Seven. visit in their home, not counting that knocking on the door, yeah. that's when they discovered we were Mormons. And of course that's when sure. most of the time we were sent the door. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. I never yeah. heard that before. That's fascinating. <clears throat> well, so obviously you weren't preaching uh, Jesus and the Bible. You were of, of anything. Well, I mean, I thought I was. Yeah. I thought oh, I was, I did. but it was, yeah. very, it was very select verses. Yeah. Yeah. Years later, when I really started studying the Bible, I realized I don't know this I don't know this book at all. I never learned this book, and I preached full time for two years to Christians. Yeah, isn't that funny? Yeah. So you get, come home, you graduate from BYU. Graduated from BYU, degree in economics. Yeah. And uh, about six months afterward, got married in the uh, temple in Salt okay. Lake City. Yeah, Kathleen. To my wife that. Kathleen, who I believe has appeared on your show. Yeah, yeah, last time. And a couple months after that, I uh, went to grad. I we moved to Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I entered the MBA program at the University of Michigan. Oh, congratulations! And uh, big, uh, I'm a big Michigan <laughs> fan. Well, I grew up near the University of Michigan, and huge. I'm a huge Wolverine fan. That's a, uh, that's an aside. Yeah, that's. A, <laughs> so if you don't like Wolverines out there, sorry, but um, so. Uh, during that time, we joined the local LDS branch and also took classes during the week, or at least one time during the week at the Institute. Yeah. Got to know the other graduate students, primarily graduate students more than undergrad. There were several PhD uh, candidate students that I became friends with, in addition to the instructors at the Institute. Sharp people, I mean, very people smart, that are very smart people. Knowledgeable. At least a couple of them are currently still professors at BYU. Oh. Went on to become professors of BYU. Oh, and what I think Kathleen kind of mentioned here. Here's where you ran into some questions, right? Because you knew or some of the history and doctrine was coming up, or this would come up over a period of time at these institute classes, not on Sunday, but during Wednesday, kind of yeah. Wednesday evening. And I live very close to the institute anyway. Well, in fact, the Michigan Business School is directly across the street from the LDS Institute. Oh, okay. So it's very easy for me between classes if I might go over to the institute and chat yeah. with some people just socially. Yeah. And I started becoming exposed. Part of it was overhearing other people's conversations <clears throat> about things that Joseph Smith did and changes that were made in the Book of Mormon and practices that were kept secret. That just shocked me. I mean, I'd never heard anything like that growing up. Here you are, growing up in the church, been yeah. on a mission, married in the temple, right. graduated BYU, and hadn't heard all this stuff. And these were these were very smart LDS people. These weren't yeah. these weren't anybody else. These they were, were anti Mormons. These were very active. Most yeah. of them most of them were from Utah. Yeah. And had come from longtime uh, Mormon families. Yeah. And. And, and I remember on a couple of different occasions with two of these two of these people, on different occasions I asked, you know, how can you, you're so active in the church, does this bother you? Or how can you even be active yeah. knowing or at least believing these things? At, at that time I wasn't sure I believed what they said, frankly. But I said, if, oh, you, belie if yeah. you believe these things, uh -huh. um, you're still active in the church. Uh, how do you and, do that? <laughs> and, and they did not give me a satisfactory answer. Basically the answer boiled down to I always been in the church I love the church my family's all in the church I'm never leaving the church mm -hmm. they didn't really testify to me as is often the case but they didn't really testify to me the church is true I know it's true they didn't say I know it's true they just they kind of these. gave me the kind of practical benefits of it yeah and that was increasingly not very satisfying <laughs> And then I, so then I started doing some research on my own. Oh, uh, I wondered if you started reading in books and things. And checking out what they had been checking saying. Checking what it, and, there were different versions of the Book of Mormon. I didn't know that. Yeah. And what about this polygamy thing? It looks like Joseph Smith practiced polygamy way earlier than the Revelation. How, what's that all about? Yeah. Did and you know I, that he'd married women that were already married? No, or of course young? not. Absolutely not. I didn't, no, know. I didn't know if I even knew that during that period of time. No, oh, really? But just the I fact that he was practicing polygamy maybe 10 years before it was announced. Yeah, um, that's weird. Those I mean, kind of things just shocked me. I guess I maybe it was even the upbringing from my mother. Yeah. You know, you always need to be honest. You always need to tell the truth. And I was just, I expected... I, ex I expected a very high standard for Joseph Smith. Oh, Obviously, well, sure. he was the ultimate. He was the yeah. 
He was the right, right behind Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Joseph Smith. Yeah. So then, what happens? You you share this with Kathleen. We had listen. a we had another couple that was in the branch. He was a he, this was going to get me into trouble, I guess. He was a PhD candidate in psychology, so oh he was boy. a very kind of intellectual person. Yeah. And we they became our best friends. We did all kinds of things socially with them. And then we'd sometimes get together for game games. We'd play games, but we'd just talk, we'd just talk about the church. We'd really? go on for hours and hours about these kinds of about things. these about, kinds of questions. Did you talk about, about like doubts. the Book of Mormon, archaeology, that kind of stuff, and a little bit Book of Abraham? But we talk, he and I were both uh, returned missionaries, and so we talked about his mission and my oh, mission, okay. and we talked we talked about the fact that I'd get people to we for example, I had a family that we worked with for several months that be, uh, on my mission in Switzerland that became converted and were baptized, five children. Mm. And two weeks after they were baptized, the father of the family had what he felt was an answer to his prayers, that he had made a horrible mistake, that Mormonism was false. I think he even said, of the devil or something like that. Dear. And the whole family left, and that was it right there. After all that work and prayer and everything we'd put in, and we'd been told that if they pray sincerely, yeah. they're going to know the truth of these things. And it just seemed to... And so then I was talking with my friend. So who, disappointed, I'm sure, in that whole... Yeah. Yeah. And so then I talked Thank with you. my friend, Todd, um, return missionary. He'd been in France. And he had similar experiences. He was saying, "Yeah, I'd get get people to pray, and they didn't get they didn't get an answer that the church was true." And so we kind of, uh, admittedly, <laughs> I say admittedly, but I think yeah. we kind of fed off each other and said, yeah. "Wow, this is something's how something's can, how not can right they not here. pray and get the right answer yeah. or something? Yeah, it must be their fault." So course. over a period of the couple of years, we were just there a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I got in my second year there. I was already in the Elders Quorum Presidency. We were still very active. Yeah. And uh, then I was called by the stake president. The stake president used to be my home teaching companion in the Livonia Ward. I knew him pretty well. Oh, had Lord. great respect for him. Yeah. And he called me to be the Elders Quorum president. And because you were a counselor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, he knew me better than oh, anybody sure. else there. Yeah. yeah. In uh, in Ann Arbor and. Um, Boy, did I wrestle with that. I was almost going to take it, but I, I wrestled with it, and I thought about it, and I did pray about it. And I think this was over a period of at least a few days. I came home from class one day, and uh, Kathy was at home, my wife was at home, and I said, I can't believe I even said this, I said, <laughs> I don't believe any of this. I literally, I didn't even, I didn't even, well, she knew we'd been questioning and questioning and questioning, but I'd never even approached making a statement like that. I was almost surprised Verbalizing at what I said. Verbalizing that I was almost surprised a, at what I said, yeah. but that's what I said. <laughs> and now what do I do? Well, I don't think I can accept this. I don't want to, I'm not going to be false, and I'm also not going to spend all this time yeah. on something that, that I'm not really convinced I don't really of. believe it. And you're surprised at these professors that know so much and are still, I guess, putting stuff on a shelf. Well, I know you went through a, uh, Kathleen was saying that you went through a period of time, both of you, that you kind of wandered in the wilderness, as it were. And We did, and sometimes you know, we were wandering in the same areas, and sometimes we were wandering in different areas. Different directions, uh, I, I, huh? I uh, had my newly minted MBA and launched my corporate career with a big pharmaceutical company, and we moved around oh. a lot. So a lot of my energies over a period of quite a few years were with, in my with career. Your career yeah. And then especially when I'd get either promoted or transferred, or then you have to really, when you get a new position and you have a new home and a new area, you really your focus I, has I to immerse be. myself. Sure. And she was exploring a lot of different things, and she'd share with me, and I'd listen to what she was saying, but not necessarily on the same wavelength. Yeah. I think it's a tremendous blessing of God that we were able to have our marriage preserved and be open with during each all other. this time. And we, yeah. we were always able to talk about yeah. these things. Yeah. So what brought you kind of, did, was it you first or Kathleen? Who, who kind of came to the Christian side of things? Uh, take a look at that first. What she might have been slightly ahead of me. It was. It was really. Uh, I think she was, but it was. It was. It was within the same year. It was within the year two thousand. Yeah. Um, I think in her interview she mentioned about some of the Christian people that had been that had been brought into our path. Yeah. 
One of the things that made a, tr and it was in the year 2000, that made a tremendous impression on me, and this was not a class she was going to, I started attending a community Bible study class once a week. It was interdenominational. Non okay. Yeah, we, w we were already at that time attending a church, a PCA church in Dover. And we were, in fact, already in a community group. So we were studying the Bible in that okay. group. Okay. But besides that, I was really interested in learning the Bible because, again, as I still thought of myself as a returned missionary that really didn't understand the foundational book of the whole thing. Yeah. <clears throat> That's such an interesting comment. It is the foundational book. And everything that Joseph Smith came up with should have been checked against that, right? Yes. <laughs> Before we moved yes. on and yes. accepted what Joseph said. And it was foundational. Anyway, go ahead. I'm right. Sorry. Well, in the community Bible study, we were studying the book of Acts. Yeah. And I'm really glad, in retrospect, that's still one of my favorite books in the Bible. Because that shows the power of the Holy Spirit and the power... Of God's the power that has been given to God's people, post crucifixion, post resurrection, right. and 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 the miracles were still occurring, and the spirit was powerful, and the way the church, it's just so miraculous how the tiny little persecuted church. Um, I I remember reading uh, one of the predictions that was made by one of the emperors of Rome that uh, someone was asking him about this troubling rebel group of Christians, <laughs> and he confidently said. They will be extinguished within 12 months. They will be gone be forever. Gone. Don't have to worry <laughs> about them. <laughs> and if they were, and if the Christians had not had the power of God, yeah. um, they probably would have been gone yeah. in, a, in a short time. Yeah. So I, but I just received a witness that this is real. This is real history. This really acts, happened. Yeah. And here's here's even the apostles bringing someone back to life, like Jesus had or doing these other miracles, but especially the way the word spread. And this is real. This so is you real. thought of them as real people, having real experiences? Real and people, and now looking back, on, looking back on it, I think, well, of course they were real people. But well, back then, that was... That was, that was It was impactful. I didn't know if they were real people or not, for sure. Yeah. You know, after all the, uh, that I'd been through, and I'd been in a secular world for quite a while at that point. One thing in Acts that kind of was interesting to me that I'd never really studied before was Paul or Peter and his dream and Cornelius and that whole right. story when he's on the roof and told to eat the, the oh, meat was, that he was had never eaten right. before. And it's I thought, so well, wow, that's why don't we talk about that in Mormonism or why don't we consider the law and grace and and I don't know, it's just interesting how how God touches our hearts and teaches us new things. Things well, I, I've never studied before. Yes, your your whole my whole worldview changes. How I view other people that yeah. we're all fallen. We're all fallen. No, Brian, you're never going to become a god. You're never going to you're never going to be have this gigantic kingdom, and for crying out loud, you know, heaven forbid, people worshiping me. But that's I, the, people worship gods, and that's yeah. I guess what you believe as a Mormon. Yeah. That someday you're going to be worshipped by all the people on some kingdom or planet. Yeah, we think we have such pride in, yes. in what we're, that we're doing everything right. You made a quote, I don't know if you remember it, but you want me to read it? It says, I'm not as great as I thought I was. It's, it's really <laughs> true. It's a humbling thing. It's a humbling thing. But you know, humbling can also be reassuring too, because it also gives me, I can, I can give myself more... Um, leeway or room to fail, I guess. And I don't mean fail in a grand way, but yeah. but mis I can make mistakes. I can, yeah. because I have, of course I make mistakes. Yeah, Brian, of course you make mistakes. <laughs> You're an incredibly fallible human being. But I didn't necessarily understand that before, no. because growing up, I was, especially in Michigan, I don't know if you can even appreciate this if you come from a Utah background, but in a high school of 3,000 students, I was the only Mormon. So I was the only one out of 3,000 that had the truth. the truth and the only one that had any hope of Getting to going, the to the, going to the celestial kingdom. So, wow, I must really be someone special. Well, yeah, we're and, told that constantly yeah, that we're yeah. special, but, but one out of 3,000, you, yeah, you were really special. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and don't, isn't it interesting that Mormons are, it's all about us and what we're doing it's it's almost never about what Jesus did and what he did for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. 
that is such a radical yes Earl that's such a radical change in how I view Jesus Christ Jesus Christ growing up he was he was a perfected man that was maybe two or three steps ahead of Joseph Smith yeah and maybe maybe he was born earlier just happened than to Joseph be first Smith. born yeah 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 but I and, and and why did Jesus die on the cross I didn't really appreciate I know no. I didn't appreciate that he died for me he mm -hmm. really you know he really died for himself in that he had to learn sacrifice and and that was part of his path to becoming a god at least that's what that's, i thought i know that's what he had to do to become a god and, and that he suffered really in the garden of gethsemane <laughs> you know not yes. on the cross he, he suffered more in the blood. he suffered more in the garden of gethsemane Which that's is, right and then, and then that turns the whole temple ceremony upside down because temples were there for the shedding of blood and not for marriage for time and all eternity or baptizing for the dead right well, so Jesus is a little different for you now. The Bible's different for you now. Prayer. Adam is different for me, and yeah. man, yeah. Adam was fall. That wasn't a real good thing that Adam did. No, we had the Garden of Eden. He blew it, <laughs> and uh, so he would. No, he's not. He's he's not a god. Yeah, and uh, the whole idea of man, I I I find that a little more. Uh, it's it's just everything about Christianity just seems more in a line with, to me with the way things really are. Like if you believe man is basically good, and part of that is not only Mormon doctrine, but I think that's American doctrine too, a little bit, or Enlightenment doctrine. Man is basically good. Yeah. Of course we have, there's the Holy Spirit that can do good things through us, and there's also we're God's creation. Yeah. But we're fallen. And so, and we never admit that. And there's do just we? such horrible things we see all the time, not just in the news, but in our daily lives. Yeah. And if we believe that man is basically good, it doesn't make any sense, really. <laughs> well, and we minimize God, uh, God and Jesus, and right. and 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 I'm wondering, even I know we're almost out of time, but really quick, we've only got a minute. Um, those professors, I wonder how much time they spent talking about Jesus and his sacrifice and. You know, as opposed to Mormon doctrine. Yeah, we Zero. just we just don't. Talk Not even one percent. Yeah, and I'm just amazed the amount of time I used to spend as a Mormon, never talking about Jesus or the Bible or those those wonderful stories. O'Brien, well, thank you so much. What would you say to the LDS people? You've got about uh, thirty seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds. I would love to speak with you, with LDS people and also with people that are secular, that don't believe in a God or have severe doubts about a God. I would love, love, love. That's what I'd like to do in my life now more than anything else. Well, if you'd like to talk to Brian, you get in touch with me and we'll make sure you get in touch with Brian. So thank you so much. And we Thanks, appreciate Earl. it. And we'll see you next time on another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files.